Welcome all of you to the 68th live webinar on orthopedic principles. Good evening to everyone from India and good morning to all those who are listening from Mexico. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Michelle Rui from Mexico City, Mexico. Uh, Dr. Rui was appointed as attending physician at the National Institute of Rehabilitation in Mexico after finishing a sports medicine fellowship at the Plano Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Center in the United States. He completed a shoulder and fellowship at the same institute and the Arthroscopic Association of North America Traveling Fellowship. He's a founding partner and attending physician at the Traumatologia Deportiva de Mexico, where he also is a co-director of the Sports Medicine and Shoulder and Elbow Surgery Fellowship. He serves as the associate editor of the Acta Orthopedica Mexicana and Shoulder and Elbow, and as an editorial board member of the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine and Sports Medicine and Arthroscopy Review. His current research interests are biomechanical, biochemical mechanisms of tendon injury of the shoulder and bone, complex shoulder reconstruction, and elbow ligament reconstruction. He's the current president of the Mexican Society of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. So today it's my honor to introduce you to Dr. Michelle Ruiz Suarez from Mexico City, Mexico. Over to you, Dr. Michelle. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real honor to, uh, to have this invitation. And it's uh, going to be my pleasure to, to share with you some of the concepts that I've been uh, working on on the, on, on the last few years on lateral elbow pain. Uh, I want to add a subtitle for this uh, presentation in particular. because not everything is lateral elbow tendinopathy. And that is what is going to focus on, on this uh, presentation. So first we have to uh, know that the elbow is a very complex joint because, uh, be because of many things. First of all, because of its uh, muscle anatomy. In this case, we're going to uh, focus in, on the lateral side that we know that the lateral mass of the elbow uh, is compounded by the extensor and supinator muscles. So these movements, these um, conjugated movements are very important for uh, the daily light uh, activities. And uh, although we, we have a, also a flexor pronator medial mass, we're not going to uh, touch on, on, on those uh, region just for the sake of this presentation. And it's very important also to, to acknowledge the nerve anatomy. Uh, three of the main uh, nerves of the upper limb go through uh, very near the, the, uh, the bone structures. We can have the radial nerve. We also have the ulnar nerve. And of course, we have the median nerve. But at the same time, these, uh, these three main nerves branch around the elbow and give a sen um, sensation and also a motor function to very specific uh, muscles around the elbow. And that is what is going to uh, be focused on this presentation. And some things that are not very uh, well acknowledged and it's very important to know is that the lateral ligament complex is compounded mainly by three different elements by what it, we know properly as the uh, lateral, uh, as the radial collateral ligament that will be like the proper lateral collateral ligament that surprisingly in this case does not play a significant role in the function. Uh, for the sake of, stabi of stability, we are going to focus in this uh, band that traverses obliquely the, the elbow. And that is called the lateral ulnar collateral ligament that is a very important stabilizing uh, uh, ligament of the elbow and of course the an annular ligament that uh, keeps the uh, proximal radio ulnar joint stable and functional. And what is very uh, curious about the elbow is that the elbow is the most congruent uh, joint of the body. We can say that it's almost ultra congruent uh, joint. And we can see here in, 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 this particular, in this particular slice 
that uh, the, the, the distal humerus is perfectly congruent with two bones, with the concavity of the, of the radial head and the convexity and concavity of the proximal ulna uh, that comprises the, the coronoid and the sigmoid fossa. So um, just by taking a look at, at this picture, we can also uh, see that bone deficiencies may cause significant uh, problems for the stability of, of this joint. But uh, let us start with the most frequent uh, cause of, uh, ten of, of lateral elbow pain. And that is known as lateral tendinopathy. Uh, as, as we are stating here, it is by far the most common cause of lateral elbow pain. But it's very important to acknowledge that it is not the only one. So uh, due to these causes, it's very important to be very, very, very specific with a history. We have to know uh, the age of the patient, the occupation, if they practice some sport and what is their level of activity in, into that sport. And the physical exam is paramount for confirming or um, having a differential diagnosis of lateral elbow pain. We know that lateral tendinopathy was first described almost 150 years ago by, by Major in the UK, and it was first described as tennis tendinitis. And since then, <laughs> it has stuck like that term as uh, el uh, tennis elbow uh, since then. And that it can be a little bit confusing, partic uh, particularly for the, for the lay public, since uh, most of them will go to the physician and they say that they have this uh, tennis elbow. And the first answer that they will do is, how is that? Because I don't play tennis. So uh, it's better to shift that term and focus in what is called the lateral tendinopathy. Um, we can also find tendinopathy on the middle side of the elbow but by far the lateral side is more frequent. And it has been described to be um, in a ratio of four to one. And some, some articles even describe it to be in a frequency ratio of seven to one, being the lateral side, as we can see, far more frequent uh, uh, affected the lateral in comparison to the middle side. And we now know that it is not a an acute inflammation, but it's rather a chronic inflammation. And when the patient most of the times goes to our office, um, the, uh, we have to, to know that uh, we are not going to treat these patients if they are acutely inflamed because most of the treatments in this phase are not going to be successful. Uh, in the 70s, Dr. Nigel described these, the findings as an angiofibroblastic hyperplasia but um, there has been some, some findings uh, from, the, from the microscopic point of view that have changed this, uh, the, the findings very, very subtle, subtle, and uh, now we call it as a tendinosis, an angiofibroblastic tendinosis. We know that the lateral tendinopathy is an overuse injury, and so we can find it in, in athletes that use their elbow uh, particularly in amateur athletes that uh, have some lack of, of, uh, of good technique for practicing their sport, mainly tennis, particularly with a backhand um, strike. And uh, also in some uh, workers that tend to use uh, very frequently their, their elbows, uh, as we can see in carpenters. Uh, it afflicts mainly the extensor carpi radialis brevis uh, muscle tendon unit, but it's not the only tendon that is going to be afflicted, particularly in chronic stages. Because although at the starting point of this, uh, uh, of this um, pathology, the ECRB may be the, the only tendon, with the chronicity, it may extend proximally and distally and afflict the rest of the extensor uh, muscles of the, of the, of the forearm and, and also the supinator muscles of the forearm. As we say here, uh, it's only 
acute inflammation found in the first two weeks of when the, when the patient is uh, beginning to experiment the symptoms. And if by chance they get to, to be symptom-free after two weeks and after some weeks or months, they again have these, uh, these uh, pain on the lateral side of the elbow. Well, maybe in the first two weeks of the second event, maybe we can find uh, again these acute findings of inflammation. But uh, from then on, we are not going to find these classic features of acute inflammation, and we're going to find this uh, chronic tendino tendinosis that is going to affect the function of the elbow, of the wrist, and probably sometimes of the hand. There are very uh, specific signs for, uh, for identifying lateral tendinopathy. And I use these three tests uh, routinely in my office uh, just to, to, to rule out or to confirm the presence of lateral tendinopathy. The first one will be the, uh, the Mills test that it uh, comprises of uh, palpating the lateral epicondyle wheel with our thumb uh, while we passively pronate the forearm and flex the wrist and extend the elbow. It's a uh, the, the patients that have true lateral tendinopathy are going to experience very specific pain in this point. Uh, the second test that I use is a Moxley test. In this case, uh, we, we ask the patient to extend the elbow and with a, with, a, with a wrist in a very slight flexion and the fingers also um, volarly flexed, we ask the patient to extend the middle finger against, uh, against our force and they are also going to experiment very specific pain in the lateral epicondyle. And finally, the Cozen test that it comprises of a resisted wrist extension with the elbow in full extension and very slight radial wrist inclination with a, with a hand in a fisted position. So none of this by itself is 100% um, sensitive for a lateral tendinopathy. But if we take these three physical exam tests uh, at the same time, we can confirm the presence or not of lateral tendinopathy. But of course, then it comes trouble. What happens if the patient still is complaining about uh, lateral elbow pain and our uh, previous uh, physical exam tests are like not completely confirmatory, then we will have to take into consideration the presence of all these differential diagnoses that we have to rule out just to make sure what the patient is experimenting. We have to rule out cervical radic uh, radiculopathy, also the presence of radial tunnel syndrome, radiocapitellar arthritis, the presence of a postural lateral plica, postural-lateral rot rotatory instability, and something that is uh, becoming more and more frequent in my practice, that is the finding of lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve compression or irritation. And we're going to dig in um, in, in all of these differential diagnoses uh, following this, this slide. So, as we said, cervical radiculopathy has very specific uh, signs that we have to, to take into consideration for the differential diagnosis of lateral uh, elbow pain. So the patient is going to experiment pain in C5 and C6 dermatomes. And as we can see here, this uh, dermatome is um, located along the uh, radial side of the form, including the thumb and the index finger. But also it may affect the C6 and T1 myotome and from a motor point of view. Um, something that I always look in my patients is uh, these, these patients that have lateral elbow pain, but due to cervical radiculopathy, will most frequently present pain, lateral elbow pain on both elbows simultaneously. So uh, a patient that is uh, presenting to your office with simultaneous lateral elbow pain, you do not have to think uh, as a first diagnosis 
as lateral tendinopathy, you, you will have to think first that it's probably a cervical pathology. And another frequent presentation uh, at, at the office is that patient that has simultaneous lateral and medial pain of the elbow. Uh, in, in, in those cases, definitely you have to rule out cervical reticulopathy and not think as the first, as the first diagnosis having lateral and medial elbow tendinopathy. Something that is very frequent is that like uh, most of uh, neuropathic pain, you will find proximal irradiation of the, of, the, of the pain. And although it's not very frequent, but it's uh, very, very indicative of, of this uh, cervical pathology is that most uh, of the patients will have also sensitive alterations. So if you have all these findings uh, at the same time, uh, probably you will have to rule out first cervical radiculopathy. The second differential diagnosis that you have to take into consideration is this, the radial tunnel syndrome. The radial tunnel syndrome uh, has a, a slide of a problem in, in the sense that patients with lateral elbow tendinopathy may have, at the same time, radial tunnel syndrome. This is not an entity that uh, goes only by its own. So, uh, so uh, some patients, particularly those patients with very chronic lateral tendinopathy, say nine or 12 months of, uh, of chronicity, may also have radial tunnel syndrome um, as, a, as a diagnosis. Um, and it's very important to um, differ differentiate between these two patho pathologies. Well, in the radial tunnel syndrome, you will also have lateral tendinous pain origin. But the difference is that the pain in the radial tunnel syndrome um, is found also with passive pronation that is not, uh, is not found in lateral tendinopathy. The, the, the pain with lateral tendinopathy is only with active pronation, not passive pronation. Also, you will have pain with, passive, with a passive extension of the wrist and pain with resisted supination that is very infrequently found with uh, lateral tendinopathy. In these patients, I use a diagnostic lidocaine injection just to rule out the presence of a concomitant radial tunnel syndrome or the radial tunnel syndrome as its own. Uh, in all of these patients that I want to rule out the presence of a radial tunnel syndrome, you must have a MRI. Although it is uh, described that patients with this entity may have findings in the EMG, in the electromyography, it's not very frequent to find uh, definitive uh, findings, so to speak, of, of, uh, of compression of the, radial, uh, of the radial nerve. It's not very frequent. You will have to have uh, these dynamic EMGs that it's not very easy to, to have, but you can have the MRI. And a very uh, important finding in this MRI, as I'm showing here with a cursor, is to find signs of denervation of the supinator muscle. As you can see, the signal in the supinator muscle is very different to the rest of the muscle of the proximal form in cases of radial tunnel syndrome. You can see this, this uh, slight edema around the muscle uh, belly of the supinator that is uh, very different in, in, in sign from the rest. Uh, you may find something in T1 images, but uh, I will, I, I, I will uh, uh, advise you to, to have uh, these lysis in T2 uh, axial cuts just to see the, the signs of, uh, of uh, early denervation of the, of the supinator uh, muscle. I also do uh, use this uh, rule of nine test. And it, it, it go, and, and it goes like this. Uh, you will make like a grid of the proximal form on the volar aspect uh, of, the, of, of the form, just starting uh, distal to the elbow crease. And you will um, 
divide in nine in in nine different sections the proximal the proximal form this is the lateral side and this is the medial side the patients with radial tunnel syndrome will have pain with palpations in uh, zones number one and two that are marked in red when the patients have pain in five in, in zones five and six you will have to rule out a compression of the median nerve. And all the circles that are marked in blue in this case will uh, be pain-free uh, when, when uh, palpated in cases of radial tunnel syndrome. And finally, in cases of this pathology, you will find weakness that is often not accompanied with pain of, of uh, middle wrist and wrist uh, of the middle finger, sorry, and wrist extension. So, as I said before, radial tunnel syndrome can go with lateral elbow tendinopathy too. So, you have to take this into consideration because very chronic uh, patients that have some kind of, of treatment of lateral tendinopathy will still experience some kind of. Um, pain after the treatment, and you will have to discard the presence of a radial tunnel syndrome. Another differential diagnosis that you have to take into consideration is the radiocapitellar arthritis. It's a uh, very infrequent to find it in uh, uh, as a primary diagnosis. Almost all patients, if not all of them, will have the history of trauma. Uh, and may have these, these findings in some cases of very subtle, non-displaced uh, radial head uh, fractures that were not recognized in the ER or when, when going at, in the first uh, days to, to a uh, orthopod office. But with time, um, they, they uh, will develop this pain on the lateral side of the elbow. And when you have an X-ray, you will have these very uh, specific findings. If you see, you can see on the medial side still the presence of a joint line between the coronoid and the, um, and the trochlea of the distal humerus. But on the lateral side, you will see that this joint line is almost uh, disappearing and you will even see some kind of overlap of, uh, of, of the radial head with a capitellum. Uh, you will have to be very careful because if the patient is not able to fully extend the, the elbow when taking this AP view of the elbow, you may be um, somewhat concerned because uh, you can see the overlap of the, of, the, of, the, of the medial joint line too. So just to rule out the presence of isolated radiocapitellar arthritis, you will have to uh, also see in the lateral view these signs of uh, degenerative uh, pathology of the radiocapitellar arthritis and this uh, presence of osteophytes in the radial head will be very, very specific for this uh, pathology. Uh, in these patients of radiocapitellar arthritis, you will have very painful pronation and supination uh, with the elbow flex, uh, and it doesn't matter if it is passive or active. The, the treatment in some cases may be the implantation of a radiocapitellar arthroplasty that is not very frequently used. And in some cases, you will argue that probably just doing the, uh, the resection of the radial head will be more than enough. Another pathology that we have to take into consideration as a, as a lateral, as a source of lateral elbow pain is a postural lateral plica. Uh, the the, the postural, lateral, postural lateral plica, just as in the knee, may be a uh, finding that uh, may not be necessarily pathologic. Uh, the thing with, uh, with a plica is that once it is inflamed, uh, the, the majority of the cases will be post-traumatic. It's very difficult to have a pain-free elbow. And uh, the, the presentation of this uh, of pain due to postural lateral plica is uh, slightly different 
to pure lateral tendinopathy because it, it, it presents with lateral pain in the elbow side of the, of, the, of the elbow, but it also is located in the posterior side of the joint. So you will have postural lateral pain, but if you palpate the posterior radiocapitular joint line, it's going to be almost an excruciating pain. Um, it, it, it is said that it is a very painful with flexion, but in my experience, I prefer to do this impingement sign with the elbow in full supination, with the forearm in full supination and extending the, the elbow while I uh, palpate the posterior radiocapitular joint line. In this case, the plaque is going to get impinged between the distal humerus and the radial head. And that is, uh, for me, the most pathognomonic finding um, of a postural lateral plica. Of course, you will also have to have some images of the MRI, and uh, you will almost always find the presence of the plica uh, in coronal uh, images, like the one in the, in the left side, and in um, sagittal uh, images, you will find the presence here in the, the, in the posterior radiocapitellar joint. Uh, the problem with the postural lateral plica, uh, especially in chronic cases, is that it's going to cause also a radiocapitellar joint arth arthritis. So in these cases, you will have to be very careful just to rule out if the radiocapitellar arthritis is the main source of the pain or the presence of the postural lateral plica. Um, this is a, 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 a video that I uh, use to exemplify the presence of postural lateral plica. Uh, in this case, it's we are going to do an arthroscopic resection of this, uh, of this structure, and we are located in the postural lateral compartment of the elbow. I'm going to sign this is the posterior aspect of the, of the capitellum. This is the sigmoid fossa. And this is the radial head from posterior. So I'm using a, a soft spot viewing portal in the posterior aspect of the elbow. And I'm using a accessory portal uh, also in the, in the postural lateral uh, compartment of the elbow. And in this case, we are doing the whole resection of the plica. But as you can see, we can also have these uh, very early signs of radiocapitular arthritis due to the impingement of a postural lateral plica. And as you can see, the, the, the cartilage in the posterior capitellum is very soft. So this is also a, a, a sign of, um, of radiocapitular arthritis, secondary to an impingement with a postural lateral plica. Another uh, differential diagnosis that you have to take into consideration is the postural, postural lateral rotatory instability, particularly those very subtle cases in which uh, the patients have the history of dislocation. Uh, we know that the most frequent dislocation is a postural lateral dislocation of the elbow. And in some cases, due to very early and aggressive rehab, or just to uh, inadequate immobilization after, uh, after the uh, dislocation, we can have an insufficient uh, healing of the postural lateral ligament complex. So in, this, in these cases, the patient may have residual uh, lateral elbow pain, but due to postural lateral rotatory instability. So it's very important to, have a, to know if the patient has any history of dislocation. Uh, some patients, particularly those patients with uh, the history of pediatric uh, distal humerus fracture that may have residual uh, cubitus varus, may also have very subtle signs of postural lateral rotatory instability. Uh, those athletes that uh, require full extension for their sport may, may also have extension overuse of the uh, lateral uh, ligament complex of the elbow and may have also very subtle signs of, of this rotatory instability. And although it is described that these patients may have a pavement shift test positive of the elbow, it's not very frequent because it is so painful that it's not very easy to have to, to do this maneuver in the office. Uh, 
almost all of my patients will have uh, a pelvic shift only under anesthesia. And in this case, we have to take into consideration if we have to reconstruct the LUCL or just uh, repair it. Uh, I've gone uh, through different phases in my professional career. Uh, first, I, I, I began doing the reconstruction, then I shifted to doing only repair. Then I came back to uh, doing reconstruction because of some residual cases. And right now I have a uh, uh, go back again to doing primary repair, but including the posterior lateral capsule that I think it's uh, also a very important uh, stabilizing uh, structure of the posterior lateral elbow. The patients with posterior lateral elbow in the MRI will, be, will have very uh, specific findings. Uh, we know that the, pay, that the elbow in, in this kind of instability is going to be unstable with the elbow in full flexion, I'm sorry, with full extension and supination of the form. That is the position that the patient has to keep during an MRI exam. Uh, most of the, of, pa of the patients that uh, go through an MRI for these uh, for this pathology are not going to be able to go through the, the, uh, the, the MRI because it's going to be very painful and very uncomfortable. And this is the reason. The, the, the patients will have this posterior uh, uh, subluxation of the, of the radial head. And they will have to go with, a, with, a, with the arm in pronation, just to have a recentering of the of the arm. But if the patients are willing to go this exam, going first the, the, the first sagittal slices with the elbow in supination and then doing the the uh, the forearm in pronation, you will have these uh, two uh, very significant images that are going to confirm the presence of a posterior lateral rotatory instability. Uh, I, I always try to, to explain to my patients what, what, is, uh, what we are going to, to experience uh, with the exam and uh, the relevance and importance of, this, of these findings. And the, the, final uh, the, the, the final differential diagnosis that we have to take into consideration is a lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve compression or irritation. Uh, it, it is a, a differential diagnosis that I am seeing more and more at my, at my office. And we have to be very careful because it presents uh, almost identical to lateral elbow tendinopathy. The difference is that these patients uh, have very painful palpation in a point that is located five centimeters or two inches proximal to the epicondyle. Uh, the patients with pure lateral tendinopathy uh, do not have any reason to be painful if palpated at this point, but the patients with lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve compression or irritation will. What I do in all of these patients is, is to, uh, uh, to go through a lidocaine diagnostic testing. And what I do is to uh, mark my, my lateral epicondyle, then I, I will go two inches uh, proximal to the elbow and just uh, infiltrate about three cc's of uh, lidocaine and almost immediately the, the pain is gone. Uh, this is a, a very uh, important differential diagnosis that has uh, to be kept in mind in patients uh, that have gone through uh, a surgery of lateral tendinopathy and they still experience pain because uh, particularly in, in, in very chronic cases, uh, some patients may have this, uh, this pain that is still located in the, in the lateral elbow, but also the, the, the difference is that it is uh, irradiated approximately about two inches. In these cases, uh, in these refractory cases, I will go through an, a, a, an erectomy of, the, of, of this nerve. Fortunately, I have not had a case of a subsequent uh, painful neuroma of, of this nerve. And uh, it is a, a very effective procedure, particularly in these refractory cases of lateral elbow pain. 
So I did not want to, to go uh, very deep into all the diagnosis, but I want to have this uh, very general overview of all the causes that will explain the presence of, uh, of lateral elbow pain. And I just want to, to say goodbye with, it, with, with, with these two thoughts uh, that the lateral tendinopathy is still the most frequent etiology of lateral elbow pain. But there is much more to lateral elbow pain than only this lateral elbow tendinopathy. And uh, thank you very much for, for this invitation. And I hope there is some opportunity in the, in the future to share with you this, this time and space. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Rui. That was a fantastic presentation. You have covered the entire spectrum of lateral elbow pain, looking into the differential diagnosis in detail. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come up. I'll just go yes. through some of those. Yes. One is uh, to identify a radial tunnel syndrome. Basically, you're looking at an entrapment neuropathy of the uh, posterior interosseous nerve, isn't it? That's right, yes. And so if there is a tenderness, say three finger breadth distal to the lateral epicondyle, isn't that a good sign? And what other signs do you look along with that to come to a diagnosis of radial tunnel syndrome? Well, first, the, 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 the nature of the pain is slightly different because uh, it is a neuropathic pain. So the patients will experience this very uncomfortable uh, sensation through the lateral aspect. And th th they will very frequently say that they don't even, uh, uh, that even the clothes are very, very uh, uncomfortable to, to, to wear. And uh, this lido can test that I uh, infiltrate the, the, the radial nerve distal will disappear almost always the, the pain at this point. But in some cases, or most of the cases, the lateral elbow pain due to tendinopathy will still remain. So uh, for me, it's a very, very important uh, test to do this lidocaine test. And uh, the, the type of neuropathic pain will also give us some, some clue on the, on the radial tunnel syndrome. The other one is a very common mnemonic that we use. It's, I don't remember whether you, you mentioned the FREAS, F-R-E-A-S, looking at fibrous bands, uh, radial uh, recurrent leisure henry, the extensive yeah. radialis brevis, the arcade of Frosi, and the spinator. So all of these, how do you really differentiate which is really causing the pain? Because there are five very important, and in addition, you have mentioned a lot of other causes as well. Yes, um, I, I think, most of the, of the patients uh, will have these MRI findings and uh, these, these, uh, these very uh, identifiable cause due to, to the, sup, the, the supinator, you will have in the MRI this denervation sign of, uh, of the supinator in the, in the MRI. It's not very frequent, at least in my, in my experience, to, to, to have a, a refractory case to any of the other causes that you have already mentioned, although you have to take that into consideration because they are also a differential diagnosis to this uh, radial tunnel syndrome. Because in addition to the points you mentioned, we have five more additional causes, so that becomes a big spectrum. Yes, definitely. And you have added uh, lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve as well. <laughs> yes. So that's going to be a really big end to and that's I think that's the reason when you look at uh, patients that does not respond to surgery, you, I mean most of them have fallen into these particular groups. Yes, and and it's unfortunately well my, my practice is much more focused to shoulder and elbow, so I think um, my practice is a little bit biased and I see a lot of these refractory cases. But I've seen that uh, a lot of these refractory cases will also have this uh, proximal pain in the lateral as aspect of the, of the elbow. And doing this uh, diagnostic test to see if it's the sensitive branch, uh, say the, the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, will be, will be a cause of, of lateral uh, pain in these refractory cases. So you need a lot of clinical acumen to make a diagnosis. You need to use the injection wisely. I think that is a very important takeaway point that we need to yes. use the injection wisely to find out exactly where the pain comes from. That's right. That's right. And uh, the other one is uh, regarding postlateral instability. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the test that is described as a postlateral instability test that you look at in flexion, I mean, in extension initially. Extension. Varus force and then gradually you flex 
and then you can feel the uh, subluxation of the radial head posteriorly. Am I right? Uh, you're right, although that is not very frequent because the patients will automatically uh, stop from doing this full extension but it, because it is going to be a very painful experience. So uh, what I'm doing now is uh, doing what is called the tabletop test. So it, it is like doing like a push-up, but you have to, to place your forearms in full supination and uh, with, with uh, sitting in a chair that has this armrest you will have to go like like this. Yeah, like that. Okay. And the, the, the patient- What's called as a uh, chair test, isn't it? Chair the, the, test. The chair test and the tabletop and the tabletop is doing this like almost push up um, exercise with, with, with a supination. And when the patients go with the elbow flex, they don't have any, any signs, any symptoms. But when they are going uh, through full extension, they are going to avoid this full extension because it is very painful or very uncomfortable. What I would do is then, then ask to go again to the flex position in the tabletop test. And with my thumb, I'm going to push uh, front posterior, the radial head, like I was, uh, like I am stabilizing and the, uh, the LUCL. And then the patients are able to go through full extension without any problem. I think it's very similar to the pivot shift of the knee, isn't it? Very closely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very, very similar. The only difference is that in the knee, you, we, we, when you do this, we, we, this uh, pivot, you will see that it, this is uh, the, 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 the rotatory uh, signs of, of instability. Yes, and in the elbow, Yes, uh, and in the elbow, in the office, it's going to be almost impossible to do because it is very uncomfortable. If you, this, if you do this, this maneuver under anesthesia, you will almost always find it. Okay, so is, in, in an extended position, it's usually reduced and as you, as you grow, I mean, go into slight flexion, it subluxates. And when you go into complete flexion, it relocates, is it? That's right, yes. Uh, well, flexion and pronation, both. Flexion and pronation in the relocation. Flexion and pronation. Yeah, it's the same thing with the knee as well because you don't, it's very difficult to elicit a reward shift in a normal patient. Unless yeah. you're anesthetized. I mean, I do ACL reconstruction and I know it, the difference because unless you, the patient is anesthetized, it is extremely difficult to do. A, yes, a, that's right. That's right. Okay. And something regarding the tennis elbow. Uh, see, uh, we, we know all those three tests, like the, there's a Cousins test, there's a Mills Manor, and also the Mods Lease test, which is nothing but a resisted middle finger extension test. Am I right? That's right, yes. I, I mean, a lot of studies that looked and they found that the Mods Lease test is one of the most sensitive tests. Do you agree to that? Yes, but uh, particularly in the, in the very acute cases, because in, in, in these very chronic cases, the Mods Lease test is going to be definitely by far the, 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 the most indicative of the lateral level tendinopathy, but the, the pain is going to be um, located much more diffuse than only in the very specific point of the ECRB origin. And uh, I know we have just gone into the diagnostic part of the lateral elbow pain, but since uh, we have gone this far, uh, can you just uh, approach, uh, how do you, if once you've made a diagnosis of uh, tennis elbow, that is the pain originating from ECRB, then how do you really treat them? <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a tough question. Uh, to be honest, I still do a lot of, of uh, steroid injections and I've had excellent results. I've gone through a different different phases through my, through my practice. I've gone through... Um, uh, arthroscopic release with good results, not excellent, good results. I've gone through open release and uh, tenodesis of the of the of the rest of the of the tendons, good results, not excellent. Uh, PRP, um, um, uh, leukocyte reach PRP, with good results, not not excellent. Uh, eccentric strengthening. Uh, good results, not excellent. And what is much more consistent with good to excellent results uh, is still this uh, steroid injection. Okay, I think that's a very important uh, takeaway point because you've gone through the entire gamut of, I mean, yes. and finally yes. 
that steroid is one of the best choices for uh, the I mean, treatment of lateral epicondylitis or if you definitely yes diagnosis of the pain originating from the ECRB and the related tendons. That's right. I think that thank you so much, uh, Dr. Michel. I mean that has been a fantastic presentation and it is a great thank you. for us to have you on board and uh, you being the president of an important organization, the message is very, very strong. Thank you so much for being with us and we look forward for some more presentations from your side. Definitely, thank you. I, I'm waiting for another invitation and thank, thank you. you. It was an honor, a truly honor. Thank you very much.